Hello once again, this is Martin Popoff. Welcome back to another episode of Overkill Rewind. This is the show where we ask you the greatest album of a certain year, and then we tabulate the results. Again, I just love reading the results of these things. Uh, they, they came flooding in. We got the definitive answer for this specific year. But before we get to uh, the year we're going to cover here on Overkill Rewind. I want to ask you, if you haven't already, don't forget to subscribe and consider supporting us on Patreon. All right. The year we're looking at is 1981. Personal memories for me of that year. That was the year I was graduating from high school, moving on to UBC. But it was also the year when the new wave of British heavy metal was in full swing. So uh, that's going to enter into our discussion a little bit here. It was a great year for metal. It was also the year that MTV uh, started up. So it started the video age, start of the 80s kind of thing. Ronald Reagan's getting uh, getting sworn in in 1981, winning in 1980, right? After the new wave of British heavy metal, we got a big hair metal thing going on. So it was a it was a big decade for, for heavy metal and 1981 is obviously pretty much the start of it all. Number five on our list, so this got the fifth most votes, is Rush Moving Pictures, issued February 12th, 1981 on Anthem Records. It is the sales leader of, uh, of 1981 amongst our five winners. This record went four times platinum in the States. What do I think of Moving Pictures? Love it to death. It was the album that broke things wide open for Rush. It's got that uh, legendary first side where every single song is a hit. We got Tom Sawyer, Red Barquetta, YYZ or YYZ and uh, and Limelight. I mean, four of the most plays played Rush songs of all time. Uh, you know, the second side is kind of the dark side of the album, but it's a huge album. They followed up with a live album and then on to Signals, but this was the massive album that broke things open for them. You guys love it. And it's interesting. I've noticed in other Overkill Rewinds that, uh, that I've done, uh, you know, Rush kind of always gets in there with a lot of votes. So it's, it's funny that... Um, you know, there are bands that we've noticed that have been kind of like uh, shuffled off to the hard rock area of the world, your Kisses and Aerosmiths and Ted Nugent's. And yet Rush, even though they weren't particularly heavy than those bands early on, has been kind of accepted by the metal community as part of metal. So they, they just routinely get a lot of votes uh, in this Overkill uh, Rewind situation. All right. So that's Rush. What do I think of moving pictures in terms of our uh, legendary skull rating? I will give this Five skulls out of five skulls. You really can't knock it. It is, you know, considered by most to be one of the top handful of Rush albums. I personally like Signals a tiny bit more, but uh, Moving Pictures, five out of five skulls. All right. <laughs> Moving on here on Overkill Rewind. Uh, what is number four for greatest album as voted by you? It is Venom, Welcome to Hell. Great to see it in here. Now, when I was compiling the votes for this, I noticed there was a little bit of uh, nefariousness uh, going on with Venom votes. There was a whole bunch of welcome to hells in a row. You know, this reflects the fact that I think the the banger viewership, you know, wants their metal metal. Metal gets heavier and heavier, obviously, as time goes on. But as I look at this list is, is certainly the heaviest thing on the list. It's some of the heaviest stuff, period, of the time. So this came out on Neat Records in December of 81. Uh, Bonsai Records in Canada out of Montreal. Montreal, combat records uh, uh, in the U.S. Uh, so it got full distribution, but you know the the mothership is Neat Records, of course. This is their first album. I prefer black metal a little bit, but so this is a really harsh album. Uh, I consider it to be recorded badly on purpose. It's a little out of tune. I remember this Manta story where he said we tuned to Kiss albums and it was always a little off depending on how, you know, where you had your turntable set. Uh, but Kronos is in there, you know, screaming, howling, hollering. Things are fast. Things are loose. Definitely not to a click track. And yeah, really rough production, really satanic. So it's it's kind of the start of thrash metal. It's the start of black metal. It's the start of a lot of things. Start of death metal. Uh, and they also are considered part of the new wave of British heavy metal. So there you go. Uh, welcome to hell. Where do I put this as a skull rating? I'm going to go with three skulls out of five here um, because it is probably way down the list of my favorite Venom albums, actually. I like the next uh, two and maybe even Possessed, actually, uh, better than Welcome to Hell, because this is really, really rough. All right, moving on. Number three, as voted by you, is Ozzy Osbourne, Diary of a Madman. 
Now, this was an incredible album. It's the second one with Randy Rhodes. Sadly, it would be the last. We would lose him to a flyby prank. Long story. After this record, we got Bark at the Moon, Jakey e. Lee, which is a great record as well. And Ozzy's career just grew and grew. This was released November 7th, 1981 on Jet Records. Three times platinum. Massive, massive album. Uh, it it routinely wins the, the, the polls as the greatest Ozzy album. I'm in there a little bit. We have our own YouTube show called The Contrary where if we have a contrarian choice for an album and we have to argue that album and I vociferously went for a bark at the moon on that although I love diary a lot as well beautifully recorded Lee Kerslake on drums and Randy with that that signature sort of overdriven sound and it just set set Ozzy off I mean it was such a such a leap up from the debut and then as I say bark at the moon was was a great album as well um possibly a you know a little bit down moving from there then Zach comes in and saves the day my skull rating on this one out of five i'm gonna go five out of five skulls again on this one all right uh number two on our list duking it out with ozzy osbourne is black sabbath with mob rules i loved seeing this up high like this uh we have very very smart viewers here this album's really coming up in a lot of people's estimation it was always considered a little bit of the uh the son of heaven and hell it's it's the second of the ronnie james dio era or the first ronnie james dio era of three eras actually produced by martin birch doesn't sound like a martin birch album at all it's got too much bass um, so it's so it's very it's very bottom end and powerful. It's just a rousing, cool metal album. Tony's guitar sounds massive. So you know people prefer Heaven and Hell. Uh, I think they always have, they always will. Um, Heaven and Hell went platinum. This only went gold, so it was a little bit of a step down. Ozzy is certainly winning the sales war at this point. He's becoming a huge, huge act for the '80s. Sabbath not so much. They're going to lose Ronnie after this. Ronnie's going to move on to Dio, and Black Sabbath's going to come out with Born Again after a live album called Live Evil. But yeah, this came out November 4th, 81. Uh, Vertigo in, in the UK, Warners over here in, uh, in North America. Great, great album. Everybody loves it. Voodoo, Falling Off the Edge of the World. Uh, you know, Country Girl, I really like that one. Starting Side 2, kind of a good good melodic one. The Mob Rules, which is the, uh, the name of the title track instead of Mob Rules, which is the name of the album. Great record. Um, I'm going to, you know, celebrating the fact that this album Album is coming up in many people's estimations. I mean, years ago, I might have given this 4.5 skulls out of five, but I'm going to go five skulls out of five this time around. What the heck, eh? All right. So number one uh, heavy metal album of 1981, as voted by you, is... Iron Maiden Killers. Really cool. Uh, this actually ran away with it. It 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 got quite a jump in votes. Sabbath and Ozzy were very close in votes, actually. They were just duking it out back and forth uh, throughout this whole thing. But Killers uh, ran away with it. So what we have here is the second and last of the Paul Diano era. I think it's a huge step up from the debut. I think it's fast and well put together and complicated. So many great songs on here. Murders in the Rue Morgue and Wrathchild. Um, just a really... Um, cool sophisticated metal album it you know maiden by this point were proving that they were the kings of the new wave of british heavy metal but shockingly it would be the last for paul diano replacing would be bruce dickinson of course but iron maiden it just just every year grows and grows in popularity and uh and and just seeing it seeing it beat out all these other bands it, it it's almost becoming routine i mean people just love maiden uh over the years more and more they keep making albums people keep debating whether there are any good or any bad but they keep buying tickets and going to the shows right my skull rating on this one out of five i'm gonna go five out of five skulls again on this one so there you go rush moving pictures venom welcome to hell ozzy osbourne diary of a madman black sabbath mob rules and iron maiden killers <laughs> Here's where we do the honorable mention. So this is the bubbling under stuff, the stuff that got a lot of votes that we want to give props to because, uh, you know, they did get a lot of votes. Uh, the lowest of the honorable mentions, Bluish Occult Fire of Unknown Origin. Uh, Martin Birch produced that as well. Great album. People love that record. Um, they had a lot of hits uh, from it. Joan Crawford was a little bit of a hit, but Burning For You, of course, and uh, what else? Uh, Heavy Metal, Black and Silver, uh, Vengeance, The Pact, and great stuff on there. Soul Survivor. Um, just a cool tight rockin' album, a little bit modern sounding. Um, everybody loves it. 
Motley Crue, Too Fast for Love. So the first crew got some got some love here. You know, that that Fast Furious, again, doesn't sound like it's to a click track. Really great raw production on it. Tommy Lee actually really is the greatest performer, I think, on it. Really weird, unsafe album. Kind of punky, kind of heavy. Number three, you know, moving up is uh, is Saxon Denim and Leather. So that this is where Saxon sort of really cleaned up and tightened up their sound. And, and this was a big album full of anthems. You know, this is the 81 album, but they had two two albums out in 1980. They had Strong Arm of the Law late in 1980, early in 1980, Wheels of Steel. So they're really, really working hard. And this was was a big record for them. So they're part of the new wave of British heavy metal, of course. Uh, second to the top in, in the bubbling unders was Def Leppard, High and Dry. Obviously, everybody loves this record. It's most people's favorite Def Leppard album. If you're an old school Def Leppard fan, I, I you know, even, even later fans that, you know, they would pick this as their favorite. It's, it, is, it obviously isn't the, the huge seller that Pyromania was, but people love this one the most. Um, it's Mutt Lang producing, not particularly acting or sounding like Mutt Lang, but it's just a good rock and slightly ACDC-ish new wave of British heavy metal album, I think. And our top um, honorable mention was Riot Fire Down Under, a killer, killer album from this uh, New York heavy metal band. This is their third album. Narita was awesome as well, but this is, you know, most metal heads will consider this a super classic of, uh, of the early 80s and and of, of the fact that there weren't that many super heavy albums coming out uh, of America at the time. And, and this was probably one of, one of the heaviest. <laughs> I also get to uh, say a few of my own picks. So I would say uh, I'd like to give a little more props to the new wave of British heavy metal and go with the likes of uh, Tigers of Pantank, Spellbound. It got a lot of votes as well. Great album. It's their second album, first with John Deverell. Samson Shock Tactics, the, uh, the last Samson album with Bruce Dickinson. And I've always maintained it's Bruce Dickinson's greatest vocal performance on an album. I just love that he's really grinding and aggressive on it. He he kind of lightens up when he gets to uh, Number of the Beast. Uh, and, and great songs like Rootsy, Earthy, a little bit old school 70s songs, but but a really nice production on it and pretty heavy. Paul Sampson never considered himself a metalhead. So I think it's just a great mix of songs. And like I say, I think it's Bruce Dickinson's be best vocal performance uh, on an album. Moving down in obscurity, Holocaust the Nightcomers, another great new wave of British heavy metal one. Moving back to California, San Francisco for Y&T's Earthshaker. You know, they had this long break after the London years with the debut and struck down and they come back with this pretty heavy, crazy album. They're like the Van Halen that never was sort of thing. Um, they, you know, they should have broke. Gillen Future Shock, debatable whether it's part of a new wave of heavy metal. I love the band Gillen. Uh, Except Breaker, their third album, really, really professional, really heavy. Um, great, great sound quality on it. And Southern Rock, Blackfoot Marauder, the heaviest Southern Rock band. So there you go. There's, there's some extra picks for you on top of the honorable mentions, on top of the hallowed five uh, that you voted for. We're going to be doing this again for other years. So, um, you know, please stick around and, uh, and we would love you to comment below, uh, you know, let us know what you thought of this show again um if you haven't already subscribe and consider uh donating to our patreon that's it uh this is martin popoff um signing off for overkill rewind go play some new wave of british heavy metal